Welcome to the Doc and Pro Show. I'm Dr. Mark Kovacs and I'm here with my good friend, Jason Bone. And today we're really, really excited to have one of the best tennis coaches of all time uh, with us. It's uh, Mr. Jose Higueras. I've known Jose for nearly two decades and we've worked together very closely and it's really exciting to have him share a little bit of his experiences working with some of the best players in the world. Uh, he, he can go into a little bit more of his background, but he's worked with everyone from Roger Federer to Jim Courier to Michael Chang to a, a lot of great juniors. And he's also a great guy. We're going to try to get into some stories, a little bit of tennis, a little bit of coaching, uh, and also a little bit of life. And he's got some great life experiences that I think all of us will be really excited to talk about. So Jose, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm, uh, this is exciting. I don't do this very often, only for my good friends. So happy to be here. I know you are. You, 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 it's great that you're will, willing to share some of your wisdom. I know you've impacted so many lives in so many different ways. Uh, from our perspective, we'd love to just get your thoughts a little bit on uh, the field of coaching in general. Um, and how you've seen it change over the last, say, 30 years or so that you've been sort of heavily involved as a coach? Yes, well, obviously, like, uh, like everything else, uh, coaching has gotten better in general, um, especially uh, due to uh, technology. Te technology ha has had a, a huge impact in terms of the, um, you can analyze pretty much everything, so you don't have to uh, watch everything in person, like in, in the old days, um, if you wanted to scout somebody, you had to go and watch matches, you know, and, and that's how we learn. Now, a lot of that is facilitated by, um, by technology. Uh, to me, a little bit of a drawback with that is that I don't think uh, young coaches uh, reach out to senior coaches as much anymore. That's how I feel. Um, I feel when I started coaching my first 10 years, uh, my interaction with, uh, with other young coaches uh, was more frequent. I think because of the uh, there is so much information on the internet that um, that I think I think that may uh, may be the reason. But that's that's something that I have observed. I don't know if it's correct or not. Uh, but in general, I think uh, once again everything gets better. Coaching is better, um, more detail oriented, and uh, and more competitive. Like uh, pretty much everything we do. From your perspective, one question that came in off uh, Instagram, which is a great question, is you've worked with the best in the world, but you've also worked with a lot of players that didn't really make it. What was sort of the biggest difference? Was it physical? Was it mental? Was it work ethic? What were the things that you would say if you were trying to uh, predict <clears throat> players' success? What would be a couple big things that you would, you would look for? Well, uh, I, I mean, I've always defined success as a coach. Uh, when somebody gives you everything. So when somebody gives you everything, uh, to me, um, I don't admire him or her less because they only reach the top 100. Um, my admiration is the same. My respect is the same because to me, that's what I look on an athlete is how, how dedicated you are and how much you actually, how passionate you are for what you do. Obviously, when, when you talk about results, um, those have to do quite a bit with everybody's ability to... Um, to take information, um, you know, how strong, how strong, um, we all know that you can get things uh, better, but only so much better according to your ability. So, so in terms of, for example, you have, uh, you can get better on your mental game, obviously, you can get better on your, on your technique, on your strategy. Uh, the great players, I believe that they are born with something already, something that facilitates all that um, a lot easier. So, so um, at least from my perspective, I work with some, with some really, really good players uh, that were, you know, 50 in the world, which for me was a huge um, achievement just because of how they went about their careers. So that's how uh, I never had any, any problems working with anybody. It doesn't matter how good they are, but as long as they bring what I feel uh, really takes me to get up in the morning and be happy and excited about working with somebody. Um, but in general, once again, I mean, you're talking about a guy like, um, probably put it easy, a guy like Roger or Rafa or Lever in his day, any of those guys, I, I don't believe you can teach all that. I think you can, you can actually bring all that with, uh, with information, but, but there is uh, something innate in the athlete that makes him so special. But in terms of success, once again, and I like to repeat that because I honestly, that's the way I feel. I'm as proud as 
with any results as long as the player brings on a daily basis what is needed to get the best out of themselves. Uh, I mean, you, I, I love to hear from you guys because, um, <laughs> once again, that's just my opinion, but that's, that's how, how I feel. Jose, along those same lines, I don't want you to have to throw anybody under the bus, but I kind of do want you to throw somebody <laughs> under the bus. But so I the most, easy. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm going to ask this question because I see this a lot in golf. The most talented player you've ever seen with the least amount of success versus the most, the least talented player that went along to have the most success. Does that make sense? Like I'm asking you from a physical and mental standpoint, when you walk in the room, you're like, that's the guy that you would think would have the most but never really did it. And then there was a guy who everyone would be like, ah, the story of Rudy or the college football player that was so tiny, but went on to be a great player. Like, give, give me a couple of the examples of those types of players. All right. Uh, without, without getting in trouble. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that's okay. We get a little trouble, not a lot. Of you know, I, I mean, I can, I can bring some, I can bring some guys, for example. Um, I think some guys have been very successful. Uh, but from my perspective, not successful enough. Uh, I will say, for example, a guy like um, Marcelo Rios got to, uh, got to number one in the world, but never won a slam. Uh, to me, that's an, uh, that's an underachievement, to be honest. Um, then you have a guy like uh, Marat Safin, great talent also, won two slams. I thought he could have done better. So, so it's not that they had a bad career, but it's just, it's just that, from my perspective, as a perfectionist with what I do, I felt that they achieve a lot, uh, but I thought because of their talent, they, they could have done better. So, and in terms of somebody that, that surprised me, uh, because of their talent, you know, or th their abilities, um, actually, I was talking to, uh, to uh, Ken Kinnear, which is the uh, director of men for, for player development. And there is a, there is a player named uh, Mark Creasy. He, um, he's, he's an American, he went to UCLA, and uh, he's a seven volume, very aggressive. Um, not, if you wanna call it, um, not a lot of talent, or, or, or even though talent is overrated in my, in my mind, uh, but, but great decision maker in terms of how he does about his, his and he's, only, he's probably 80 in the world at this point. He actually has some great results uh, this week. He's in Australia. And he's playing the finals tomorrow against uh, Rafa Nadal. So, so I talked to Kenny yesterday and I said, listen, I don't know Mark, but I know the decisions that he's been making. For example, um, at the end of last year, we had uh, quite a few challenger tournaments. He's come through challenger for the last three years. And um, just to clarify for folks that may not know, that's sort of like the minor leagues of tennis. It's professional yes. tournaments, but it's below the, the top level. So similar to say a corn fairy tour, yeah, sure. even even yes. a little lower. Yeah, yeah, those are those are that's a tough road. I mean, that's a tough road. If you're yeah. there more than two years, sometimes your your chances of of getting through are not very good. So so Mark so Mark Creasy, uh, So last year there were a bunch of tournaments um, in Europe, uh, challengers, and in the U.S. Well, who was the only player that was in Europe? Tournaments, and in general, I. I a lot of our players shy away from that because it's a lot easier to play here. So to me, that's a great story. And I told Kenny, I said, Kenny, when you see Mark, I don't know him, but you tell him that I congratulate him and I'm so happy for him. And to me, that's what it's all about in, in athletics. And, and tennis is a, is a, um, a world-round sport and you got to get out of your house to play. So it's, it's great experiences and you become a tennis player by actually making those decisions. So he's a good story, very recent, recent story. Uh, better players, for example, you talk about a guy like uh, David Ferrer. He never won a slam. He never won a slam because uh, Roger was playing, Rafa was playing, and Djokovic was playing. But great greed. I mean, yes, did absolutely everything and anything to, to get better and got to fall in the world behind those three guys, which everybody was actually behind those three guys. So. They are, you know, we have, we have a group of really good, uh, Mark have seen them, a group of really good uh, 97s and 98s um, that won all the juniors, you know, uh, in, in, in 2016, 17. Um, and winning, being number one in the world in juniors um, is a very good sign of, for you to become a good tennis player or even win a slam. 
So our boys, our boys did that um, won every slam except the Australian because they didn't play, and we had they won the slam and the runner up was American also. So it was a, you remember Mark? There's a really a great group with Francis and uh, Riley Opelka and Tommy Paul, Taylor Fritz. Um, these guys were better than these guys were better than than Zverev, Tim, uh, all these young guys that are at the top now. So a little bit from my perspective, and I, I have told them that it's not that this is not a secret. But after that, um, when you stop doing what it takes to keep with competition. Uh, competition normally passes you, and that's what happened with these boys in the last uh, few years. Now they have they have gotten back. They have gotten back to actually doing doing the work and doing what it takes to to actually challenge these guys. And I believe they are going to do it because they they actually. They're actually as good or better than those guys, and they were th three or four years ago. So that's a little bit, a couple of examples of how the way the competition is, uh, once, you stop, once you stop learning and once you stop working, uh, people will pass you. And then, and then sometimes it's not easy to catch up. So would that, be the take a, would that be the takeaway for juniors and, and maybe parents that are listening that, Yo, just because you've had some good results doesn't mean you're going to continue having good results if you don't continue to do the right work. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, juniors count for me. Juniors count for juniors, which count for nothing really. But but it counts is is uh, just that's how you grow up. I mean, you cannot go to college without going to you know kindergarten and so on and so on. So so basically, once you skip steps. Then, then competition more than likely will, you know, will will pass you, and 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 I think uh, it, that happens. Um, in generally, happens uh, too often uh, around the world because uh, you're young, you know, you start getting a little fame, you get a little money, and then it's pretty easy to go and get a little distracted. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, uh, if you're young enough, it's never too late to actually uh, try to try to get back to that. A great answer. Uh, Jason, from your standpoint, what? you've got some names for golf. Oh yeah, yeah. From uh, overachievers mm -hmm. and underachievers. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. I, it's hard to say, but I would say um, what I saw was John Daly may have, even though he's won multiple majors, had an unbelievable career. But same kind of thing, may have underachieved in his abilities of what I saw in golf. He could have, um, but. but he could have done better. However, we don't know because the way he treated himself, the way he kind of partied, the way he had fun, that may have been his key to success. Uh, he doesn't seem to work very hard, but then you have a guy like Tiger who also we could question that he might have underachieved, you know what I mean? As, as hard a worker as he is and what he's done, even though he's pretty much broken every record, he just, um, I don't know. His work ethic is kind of, uh, it, he just constantly still works. I mean, we saw him out, playing a couple of weeks ago, which is absolutely amazing that he could do what he's done even from all the accidents. But um, so I think the only guy I'd throw under the bus would be uh, John Daly because uh, I think he could have worked a little bit harder, but. Uh, but like you said, if he would have yeah. worked harder, he may not. <clears throat> sport. It, it, that's a hundred. There's a few of those guys and Jose's seen a few that if you push them too hard, they, they stop, they, break, they, stop. they quit. Yes. And yeah. that's, that's a challenge as well. Yeah. It's yeah, a fine and, line and for sure. And, and this is another thing that uh, so, there's the, the something that people uh, have gotten used to say a little bit, which is, well, people mature differently, which is, which is true. They mature different, but in general, champions don't stop doing the work. You mature different mentally, you mature different with your game, but the desire and the intentions are always there or to a very high percentage. And when I talk about this group of boys, you know, I mean, they, they know I love them to death, all the boys that I mentioned. I work with all of them. Uh, I believe that they, that they actually can be as good as those guys that I mentioned before uh, because I've seen them play and I've seen them compete. So in no way, shape, or form is a negative to towards them. From my perspective, it's, it's a positive. I normally tend to say what I think, what I think is right. And sometimes, obviously, um, sometimes people don't like that. But, but I believe that... Um, if, it, if people take it the right way, it comes from a good place, and in no way is is a uh, is a criticism. It's something that happens uh, in life, and um, and I think um, a lot of times you can correct it, but but sometimes it's not easy. Well, I think that's the key to your success: is that you say what you believe, 
and great coaches. That's the key, right? If they modify what they really believe just to accommodate the student, that's not a great coach. That's just uh, a cheerleader, right? You're not really coaching, you're cheering them on. So, uh, I mean, you see that in pretty much all professional sports, the great coaches, they, they, it comes from inside of them and what they believe yes. they're not going to modify no matter what the situation. And they, so, uh, I believe that's why you're, you, you had the success you had because you just, you believed in what you were, in what you were doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes obviously nobody's in possession of the truth. And sometimes, um, I mean, I have made decisions uh, through my career in coaching. What I, when I, I started, I stopped working with players, knowing that they were talented, knowing that, uh, that there, is, there was a lot to work there. Um, but at one point, I had to make a decision on exactly what you're saying. How much can I compromise my belief and what I believe is right, even if sometimes may not be right? Um, how, how far do I go? And that, that's a fight that I have had uh, since I coached because uh, it's, it's not a good feeling when, when you actually far away with somebody um, for the reasons that we're talking about. But at the same time, I always felt that I was doing more good doing that than, than sometimes a little bit the sadness or, 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 or the kind of a bad feeling that I got once uh, you know, those situations happen. That's extremely that. honorable. Not many can do that. You know, they, no, they, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's very honorable. That's great. So from your standpoint, talk to us a little bit about, um, we've been talking a lot about pre-match routines and you've worked with a lot of different players. How different were their sort of pre-match routines going into a big, big match, big tournament? Well, I mean, different guys and girls. I mean, I, I'm not that familiar with the ladies. Uh, I haven't coached that many, but uh, but with a lot of the guys that I work, everybody is everybody is different in general. I would say there is a norm. The norm will be more on the quiet side, so so players kind of like to get their thoughts together and uh, and kind of and kind of get into the uh, into the into the zone of going out there and, and be focused. Uh, but at the same time, uh, um, I mean, I work with some with some players, uh, and one of them was. Uh, uh, Roger that, and Roger was the opposite. I mean, Roger, you know, before the match, he, you know, you he'd be in the locker room, and uh, he was, uh, you know, cool as a goose. I mean, and then uh, the time that I spent that I spent with Jim with Courier, he was he was the opposite. I mean, he needed his time, and he needed to really get everything in order. And uh, and uh, you pro it probably wasn't a good idea to go and and, uh, and bother him when he was trying to do that. Because he was extremely focused, and that's how what got him into the time, into into really uh, to the mindset to play. But I think different players are different, and I think uh, as coaches um, we we got we gotta understand and read that, and 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 help them in whatever however way they make them feel ready to go to go out there and play. So how how would you adjust or did you adjust at all with players that maybe were too overly yeah. focused or too wound up or too tight before they went out there or players that were maybe too relaxed <clears throat> and they they weren't focused enough? Yes. Well, once again, if you if you go, it can work. It can work to the negative. If you are too loose, you may you go out there and you lose the first set six one boom, and all of a sudden <laughs> you're in the hole without even starting sweating. Uh, to the contrary, if you are at so, too intense and too focused and too anxious, it may happen the same thing with a lot more suffering because you are actually uh, or, are overdoing the, the right thing in your mind. So as you work with players and, and, and you're around them, you're starting to gauge that. If I work with a player and, and he's joking around the whole time and, and he plays a couple of matches and, he, and all of a sudden he loses the first four games in five minutes, well, the third match that he plays, I'm probably going to start uh, making some adjustments and trying for him to understand how to get his thoughts together and get his focus going. Uh, this, the opposite with the player that, that is there and, and is, it is too too uh, immersed on, on, and too anxious to go out there and try to try to make him actually relax a little bit without going and joking around and everything. But yeah, so there are different different scenarios, and I think the more you know the athlete, the more you can actually help them with that. I don't know if that 
I'd like to hear Jason and your your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, no, Mike. no. But like we have, uh, I, I believe that a lot too. You you train, you're ready to go, and uh, the biggest thing is we have this thing that uh, it's called Kiss, the Kiss method, and I think I'm sure all you're all well. It's keep it simple, stupid, right? Like you just you already are prepared, you're ready to go. So just keep it simple, enjoy it, relax, yeah. have fun. Yeah. And you you can kind of obviously the anxiousness goes away, you know, um, after you know the first game first you know uh it's but same in golf you know the first couple of holes there's always some anxiousness then it all kind of goes away and uh but you know trying to just keep that kiss method down you know so we yeah. always were taught just try to keep it really simple so um yeah yeah that that word that you just said i mean mark knows me long enough um i use simple and simplicity a lot i think it's a lot easier to go through life like that and I think it's a lot easier to go through through uh, uh, through athletics like that, and um, and keeping it simple is one of the keys. And I think if you look at the at the top athletes, uh, within the uh, how how difficult it is and sometimes how complicated it is, they always try to bring it back to 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 have it as simple as possible. That's but I think one of the things is the smartest people I know keep it the simplest because they understand yes. what works and what doesn't, and they don't waste time or energy or resources yes. on things that don't actually make a difference. I think one of the problems we see now is way too much time spent on what I call fluff. It's it's time wasting activities that isn't making the athlete better, whether it's mental drills, whether it's physical drills, whether it's technical stuff. If it's not making the athlete better, it's not a good use of time. I, I cannot agree more. Listen, I, I once again, I, I use technology. I use everything mm. because nothing goes back. Everything gets better. So, so I'm going to try not to, not to fall back. At the same time, I have something very clear. You learn how to play tennis hitting tennis balls. You don't learn how to play tennis listening to somebody telling you 24-7 how good you are or how, or how bad you are or whatever it is. So, so I have that very clear. And, uh, and normally, and normally, um, I mean, the way I, I, I run practice, um, vocal coach, I don't stop the practices. And I try to keep my talking to the minimum. And I love to ask questions instead of just telling people what to do all the time. So, so I cannot agree with you anymore, Mark. I think there is, but that's a little bit what I was saying before. There is so much out there. There is so much about nutrition, about uh, you know, sports science, uh, analytics, uh, mental deal. I mean, there is so much that you can forget how, how because, because in the old days, not only old days, uh, not to old days, um, guys don't, in girls didn't have that. And they were great tennis players. So in some way, they, they, they kind of got that knowledge uh, without that much which comes back to the simplicity that we're talking about yeah no a hundred percent i think that's that's the benefit is you learn from the past you take what's good in the future and try to add to it uh from yeah. your standpoint are you seeing you know golf's gone into technology more than tennis has in some respects has that caused problems it definitely changed how players play but what's the benefits and negatives of it? Yeah, I think the negatives are exactly where we're saying there's too much fluff. You know, you're not you're spending a lot of time chasing uh, a tail that you're never going to catch. You know, and so you might as well just go, get back to the basic roots and work hard and and focus on the things that are going to make you better. But uh, I don't know. Um, I would love to hear an example like um, in golf. I had an example where I felt like I couldn't I wasn't putting very well. So I went to my coach. And I asked, hey, not putting very well. What do I want to do? What, how do I do this? And I was getting way too mechanical. And my coach just said, all right, look, take your right hand, putt the ball. I made a putt. And I'm like, I can't make any putts. And so he just put one hand on the putter. He made me putt the ball. I made putts. Put the, and then he told me to take my right hand off, put my left hand on the putter. I made putts. He was just trying to show me that it wasn't a mechanical thing, that it was kind of the mental aspect that I didn't I, – I understood – the, the the fundamentals of what needed to happen. It's just that my brain was sending this blockage that I thought. So I'm curious in, in tennis, uh, can you give me an example of some point in your coaching that somebody had this block, they just couldn't do something 
and you were able to kind of send it in a way and uh, either mechanical or change the verbiage of how you were trying to speak it or give him a drill or something that he ended up being able to flip that block and, and turn it into a success or change the habit. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think when you try, one of the biggest things that I, that I found with, with players is that, that um, they, focus, they focus on the result. I mean, the first thing when they try to get something better the first part, I don't know in golf, but what I will say the first part in golf when you're trying to correct something, you miss it, shit, you know, this is not working. <laughs> uh, so in tennis, it's the same thing. So, so the first thing I try to take out of the equation is the result. Because without doing the right, without doing the right thing, whatever it is, mechanically or mentally or physically, it doesn't matter how much you work, uh, uh, on the, how much you, con you, you worry about the result. So w once I, I identify what the, uh, what the issue is with, with the player, I try to take that pressure away from the result and make him understand that, hey, you can worry all you want to. If you don't get in this position, it doesn't matter. So why don't we focus on getting in that position and then, and then we worry about the execution. Because otherwise you're worrying about one step ahead that unless you get the first step corrected, uh, you have no chance of making that shot. And, and that's something that, that um, it has worked well, to be honest, a lot of times. It takes pressure away from the athlete because the, the first thing is the result when we're trying to work on something or trying to get something better. And I, I will say something that uh, one of my, uh, one of the uh, uh, things in, in my coaching career that I still think about often enough, I spent some time with a guy's name, uh, Guillermo Coria. Guillermo Coria was an Argentinian, was an absolutely fantastic tennis player. Uh, through the years, he, he got the yips on his serve. And uh, he will double fall 25 times a, a, a match. So I started working with him and, uh, and uh, we, we practice and we work through some mechanics and so on. Uh, but it had nothing to do with the mechanics. He had to do with his, uh, with his mind. So for example, he'll play, he'll play a match, he'll, he'll, he'll double fall, um, 24, 25 times, we go on the practice score right away and he'll hit uh, 40, 50 second serves and miss three, which kind of obviously uh, it shows that it had nothing to do with his technique, but it had to do with how he approached hitting those second serves. And for the life of me, uh, I lost so many hours of sleep just thinking about that uh, but I could, I could never get it. I could never get it, get it right, you know. And um, and I wish, I wish um, before I die, somebody comes and tells me why, because that's one of those things that that kind of eats me up, to be honest. That's about the only guy that I work with that I wasn't able to make uh, the at least an acceptable progress on something that we were working on, and that really, that really got me to be honest. And for the folks that don't realize, um, Coria got to, I think, as high as two or three in the world. Yeah, oh, he was a great player. Yeah, so he was like one of the best mm. at the at his time. Um, and, you know, he definitely went downhill as a result of this. He really couldn't figure it yes. out. And his results, ne he was never able to get back to that level. Yes. Uh, I know there's been quite a few golfers that have sort of had that same experience where they've had the yips and they have never really fully able to recover. Now they're commentators. <laughs> yeah. <that's right. laughs> I'm not a commentator yet. No, <laughs> oh, no, 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 not you. <laughs> but you know what? The thing with, uh, with Guillermo, uh, because I, we had some really nice, uh, really nice talks, and, and, uh, and he didn't have a very good reputation in terms of, uh, of how he dealt with people and so on. But we had a great relationship. And uh, and I asked Guillermo, where, are these, where is this coming from? And when he lost, he lost the finals of the French Open being up two sets to love and, uh, and being a much better player uh, than the other guy. Uh, and then he, they, he told me that they changed his serve. And, that, and that's why, um, I'm, I mean, I had that thought before that, uh, but it kind of reaffirmed. Um, how dangerous it is sometimes to, to change something unless you have absolutely no options. And I think uh, he used to tell me, Jose, they, they, changed my, they changed my serve and, um, 
and that was it. And you couldn't get him out of, uh, you know, out of that. So, so changes once again, I'm not a big fan. In the tennis world, I'm not a big fan of uh, grip changes, uh, especially. Uh, I think they are, especially as you get older, when you're young, you, you, you can adapt with, you know, it takes a little time, but, but you can do it. When you, the older you get, um, I would. Will...